So one of the neat things about Laplace's equation is that um, we, we can derive these uniqueness theorems for them. Um, so the question that kind of inspires the uniqueness theorem is like, given that your Laplacian is equal to zero, and given some boundary conditions, right, is that enough to get one solution? If you have too few boundary conditions, then you might not you might get many solutions that are possibly that would possibly work. If you have um, too many boundary conditions, then there might not be any solution at all that satisfies all of them. And so the question is, you know, how much is enough? Um, so um, in in one dimension, if you just think really quickly in one dimension, where we have like a line, right? Now we could specify at at uh, any of the endpoints, we could specify either v or grad v, right? And that would basically tell us that, that would give us some information about what that, that end has to look like. But if we just specified one end of this thing, then really the other end can be anything at all, and we have an infinite number of solutions. So really we need to tie down and select, specify both ends, or as you'll see later, all ends in one dimension if we want to get a unique solution. Um, so in, in multiple dimensions, the uniqueness theorem says uh, that the solution, I'm going to write this out, so theorem. This is kind of important. You'll see it on my video, you'll see it in the book. So uniqueness theorem, number numero uno. Okay, so solutions to the Laplacian uh, are unique for a region. If all boundaries of that region uh, have v given, okay, that basically says if you if you tell me what's happening around a particular region, then I can tell you that there's exactly one solution inside of that region uh, region for the potential. Um, basically looks like this. So we have some randomly configured region and as long, so we want the V, we want the V inside of here and we're given on all V's on the edge. Then we can t I can tell you what the potential would be inside of this region. I can't tell you outside, but I can tell you inside what it's going to look like. Um, so here's, here's a short proof, right? Um, so proof. It's a rather simple proof. So suppose we have two solutions, right? Suppose we have two solutions. Um, for same boundary conditions, right? And so let's specify another potential, V3 which is just equal to the difference between those, right? And of course, this is a potential as well. So it has to satisfy uh, Laplace's equation. Um, and these other two have to satisfy Laplace's equation as well. And um, note that um, the boundary conditions of V3, okay, so the BC are zero, okay? That means that all around this region that we're talking about, V3 has boundary conditions of zero because it's V1 minus V2, and these guys have the same boundary conditions. So the same number minus the same number gives you zero, right? Well, if B V3 has boundary conditions of zero, then a, the only solution that works for that is basically V3 equals to zero. Well, if V3 equals to zero, then the difference between those two are zero. These must be the same, right? And that's basically what the proof looks like. So um, let's go through an example, uh, Faraday's cage. So we have uh, we have some conductor with a cavity, and there's no charge on the inside. Okay, and the question is that show that V is constant. So we want to show V is constant inside the cavity. 
okay? And we're given, because it's a conductor, right? So we want to find V on the inside here. We know that the V here is some constant. Inside a conductor, the potential is constant. It doesn't change from one part of the conductor to the other. So um, now I can think of a really easy, um, we're going to call this V naught, by the way. This is V naught. I can think of a really easy solution for this. I just say, well, what if I had V equals V naught? Are the boundary conditions satisfied? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to the uniqueness theorem, that's the answer. Because it's a solution, it's the solution. Um, that's uh, all the work you need to do to prove that, <laughs> really. Um, now, of course, you know that the electric field inside of the, the volume inside of a conductor is, is going to be zero. Uh, so obviously, you know, grad V uh, is going to be zero as well. So grad V is zero, so obviously V has to be constant throughout that region. The, um, I like this quote, and I'm going to write this down. Um, so the uniqueness theorem, and my handwriting is getting progressively worse, is a license to the imagination. Meaning, when you're solving these problems using the uniqueness theorem, all you have to do is find a solution. It doesn't matter what method you use. As long as the boundary conditions are the same, then it's a solution. It's the solution to the problem. So um, we're going we're gonna to see some examples of that later on. Um, but how you get that solution is moot. It does not matter what methods you use to get that solution. As long as the solution satisfies the boundary condition and Laplace's equation, it's, it's the solution. Um, an interesting thing to note is that for Poisson's equation, where we have uh, equals minus rho over, rho over epsilon naught, so we have some charge inside that region, um, this same uniqueness theorem works by the same reasoning. Namely, let's suppose we have two solutions, V1 and V2, that satisfy boundary conditions, and then we specified V3 is equal to V1 minus V2, right? And so, grad, uh, I'm sorry, Laplacian of V3 is equal to the Laplacian of V1 minus the Laplacian of V2. And we know that these both have, and it's minus, minus rho over epsilon naught. And so the Laplacian of V3, or I'm sorry, the Laplacian of V3 is Laplace's equation. Hope that doesn't confuse you too much. And what's the boundary conditions of V3? So the boundary conditions um, is equal to the boundary conditions of V1 minus the boundary conditions of V2, so it's zero, okay? So since it's zero and it follows Laplace's equation, therefore V3 must be equal to zero everywhere. That's just following the first uniqueness theorem, which, you know, obviously works. And so that means that V1 and V2, so that means zero is equal to V1 minus V2, or V2 is equal to V1, even for Poisson's equation. So this works also for Poisson's equation. Um, Good times. <laughs>